This podcast is presented ad-free by Compass Mining, the largest marketplace for Bitcoin mining. Check out compassmining.io today if you want to buy, sell, or host an ASIC. And now, onto the show. You've been in space for a decade now. How do you see it like progressing, or how have you seen it progress, just from your perspective? I, it, in it's industry and it's elsewhere. progressed from... You really had people in their basements, right? You had you had very unsophisticated investors. You had people that were um, in this space for the cypherpunk uh, rationality. You had people that were, you said an eclectic group, uh, but you did not have sophisticated institutional style investors. Uh, you didn't have sophisticated regulatory uh, uh, people that were looking at it to see how this could be regulated within, let's say, the United States or or smaller ecosystems with in terms of you know fi- the financial community or or states or localities. And so you just we've seen an explosion in terms of uh, people that are involved in the space that are very technically savvy, uh, institutionally astute, and part of the capital market stack. And so for the first time ever in the history of this network. In the last 18 months, we've, we've seen institutional adoption, institutional interest, uh, institutional investment, and that's going to lead the charge into the future. And so we're really seeing a much more complicated uh, interest from mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. And in order to grow adoption, you need to have that story uh, put together well, too. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to provide a technology to the world that is uh, disruptive to the core of to to the core of all other technologies, but it, it but it's but without the ability to educate, as we were just talking about, you know, Stefan Levera and a, and a lot of other early podcasters uh, really took them took the reins on that. The education is the most important part. Yeah, we can have the best technology ever invented, but if no one knows about it. What good is it? Mm-hmm. And so you're seeing people coming out that that normally would not have uh, been in the space. Mm-hmm. And that's a direct result of the educational programs by people that put together a very uh, well-rounded, well-versed programs on what this technology is and what it does. Mm-hmm. It's very confusing. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a massively confusing topic. I think most people, when you're introduced to it, like I... Like they have the same exact uh, uh, response that I did in 2011. Um, different today, but the same response in that you expect this to be much simpler technology. Digital money sounds silly, mm-hmm. right? So anything that's digital and it has and it has some kind of monetary technology, you assume that that there's going to be some type of scam involved. I think yeah. most financial or legal people or government officials feel, you know, feel that way. And so when I first was introduced to the network in 2011, I looked it up and uh, on Google. And the first thing that it showed up was that uh, people used it to buy drugs on the internet, right? Yeah. right? And so uh, I have a number of privilege licenses, gaming licenses, banking licenses. I'm a lawyer. I have a law lawyer, license. I have other privilege licenses. And and those lic- and because of those licenses, when I saw people utilize this technology to buy uh, narcotics on the internet, I, I, I stayed away, right? Yeah. I said, you know, I probably should not get involved in this. Um, only later did I read something that piqued my interest and caused me to read the white paper. And when you read the white paper and you look at some of the literature that was early on, they talk about ledger technology. Mm -hmm. The actual white paper, interestingly enough, does not talk about blockchain, right? They Mm. they talk about blocks and they talk about a chain, but when they put them together, it's a time chain. Satoshi Mm -hmm. is or it's a time chain. Um, And so when you look at ledger technology as, as it existed through humanity, you see that there's really been very few innovations in accounting, which is what ledgers are accounting for humans. Yeah. And so the, the, that, the, the very small number of innovations to accounting globally mm-hmm. it is shocking when you think that the whole world runs on this accounting technology, right? The, yeah. the, your companies, the, 
the banks, the government, every corporation in the world, all banks in the world utilize 1400, uh, 700 year old double entry accounting technology that was created in the 1400s. So the reason that that hasn't innovated is, is a different discussion. But I think to, to, to your question, the people have changed in terms of the, the sophistication Mm -hmm. of the investors and the people promoting this technology. And I think that's a good thing for adoption yeah. in order to, to help people become aware of this network. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing in there that you, you know, you said it like a few times now, the word adoption, have you, have you noticed at all any sort of slowing in adoption in this, well, the, what we're going to this bear market? Like I, 2017, 2018, it was like, once it became very public, like everyone started to know about Bitcoin 2017. It was, I feel like that was the first big, like everyone was aware of this technology. In 2018, the adoption seemed like it significantly dropped when the price went down. But this cycle, it Why? does seem like Why does it's- it seem like it dropped? Just the interest, like people were getting into it and then they were getting out of it. Right. Institutions were using it, or excuse me, companies were like accepting it as payment and they're like, oh, we're never gonna accept that. The excitement kind of went away. So- Versus this one, do you, do you see any sort of hard, differences between yeah, the two? It's hard to know the exact numbers of adoption, but I can give you a rough estimate. In 2017, I started uh, construction on my first enterprise grade facility up in the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina. The, the number of people utilizing the network estimated at the time was approximately two and a half to 2.7 million people. Mm -hmm. And I had to discuss that with the investors and the mayor of the town and and the people that were coming on board, engineers, construction people, architects that were helping us to build this facility. So we had about two and a half million to 2.7 million people utilizing the Bitcoin network five years ago, right? Today, the adoption's estimated at 100 million users. So we've, you know, 33 to 50 X. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it's hard to look at adoption of something like this, this groundbreaking technology in a six month, 12 month horizon that you have to look at it over several years. And so if you look at it over several years, the birth of this network, 2009, 13 years later, 2022, over hundred million users globally. Uh, that's a massive adoption rate. I think if you look at industries and technology, like the internet itself, right? The internet was invented, I think in the fifties and went to civilian use in the eighties. Uh, early 80s, uh, which started, it started breaching into civilian life. In 1999, so let's say 15, 16 years after the birth of the internet, The Guardian and several other uh, newspapers and periodicals globally, guess what they said about the internet 15, 16 years after mm -hmm. the internet was introduced to civilians. Mm. That is a fad. That's a fad that it has no use. It's uninteresting and will go yeah. away. You know, right? This this ability to democratize information globally is not important. Uh, you saw you saw guys like uh, I always say his name wrong. Uh, Paul Klugman or Klu Krugman, Klugman, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, who's on the New York Post or where is he? New, New York, York Times, Times yeah. guy. Yeah, uh, his, his quote is always my favorite about the internet. He said. I think late nineties or maybe even early two thousands, but probably late nineties. I should, I should be aware of when the quote was, you said the internet's no more interesting than the fax machine, mm -hmm. right? It'll, it'll provide uh, as much to the technology fronts as, as fax machines. So the adoption rate of new technology is unknown, yeah. right? It's an unknown factor, but going from zero to hundred million people in about a decade is, is a, is a major and, and real trajectory of, of adoption. Yeah. And I think the, the benefits that this network provides to individual liberty yeah. will be what causes the adoption to, to, to continue to have a trajectory in the same pace that it has now, if not faster. I think even in today's world, as people see their individual freedoms erode, yeah. uh, they're looking for ways to counterbalance that. And um, this is the technology that does that. So adoption, I see growing. Governments uh, have been a great advertisement. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the best marketing for Bitcoins, you know, Trudeau and, and some mm -hmm. of these other guys that just started seizing the assets of their civilians. And, and it sounds like the courts in Canada are ruling against him for doing that, which is good for them. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I keep going with, with public markets. We can, you brought that up a second ago, the public markets are an indicator of interest and people obviously bring capital into it for Bitcoin mining specifically. And then also for just like public markets in general, the interest in Bitcoin has been growing. We've seen a lot of funds moving towards Bitcoin, allocating investors capital into Bitcoin, whether that be in Bitcoin mining stocks or other firms, um, just in general, obviously, like push for ETF is, is a big place. People are looking for deploying capital into uh, into Bitcoin. Do you, so from an adversarial mindset, do you see that as like a net negative for Bitcoin in any sense where you like, there are capital markets now that are coming into Bitcoin and those stakeholders don't have the same ethos or value that early Bitcoiners had, right? They have very different mindsets. Do you see that as like a contradiction or possibly like a clash that needs to be resolved between the two sides? I don't know that there's two sides. I think that there are people that were early adopters and, mm-hmm. and believe Bitcoin should grow in a certain way. And there are people that are getting into Bitcoin now and have their own yeah. mindset in terms of ado- growth and adoption and, and how, the, how the network grows. I think everybody's opinion on it is pretty much irrelevant. It's going to continue to grow. It's the first distributed and decentralized network in human history. It's immutable, right? So you, it's an unalterable record. And there's no way to hack it. In order to hack it, you have to hack all of the servers simultaneously. Yeah. So what any individual believes should happen is mm-hmm. is nice. Mm-hmm. But I think you're not going to be able to control the environment in which this technology grows. Yeah. It's just going to grow in the manner and 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 the method that, that it chooses to grow in yeah. uh, organically. And so even though it doesn't sound like regulators and capital markets and public companies getting involved in this is organic. It is Mm -hmm. It's grown organically and it's going to grow globally organically. And as the network grows globally and governments and capital markets and other states, countries and nations uh, develop the, the, or develop the understanding of the network, uh, it'll, it'll self decentralize Mm -hmm. beyond our borders. Uh, right now we were we were gifted right a uh, half a trillion dollar technology now uh <laughs> when when china shut the borders down to to mining which if they did or yeah. did not is still in dispute right are they 20 percent of the network or are they zero percent of the network uh competing papers come out on what the infrastructure footprint is inside of china um i think trusting any chinese statistics is 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 a dangerous uh skill set that i wouldn't want to be um, quoting, but I don't think people know what the footprint is trying to, yeah. but they but dropped. Well, they, yeah, and they did make it inhospitable to a number of miners who left. Yeah. Right. And a lot of that capital came to the United States, which is a net positive for the U S because any country that builds a significant footprint in this network will become stronger economically. Yeah. And so we should embrace the technology here, which yeah. is what Dennis and, and I have had dozens of conversations, not just with each other, but with other elected officials and people that could help uh, prevent the chilling of this technology within our borders. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's that. But I think, you know, in terms of whether I like or think that there's a net positive is a relative, you know, I could like it or I could dislike it, but I don't get to control what the network does. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people make. They're like, oh, this is terrible for the network. The network's going to do what the network's going to do. It doesn't really care what you feel about it. What about when it comes to the centralization? Like now people are having this dialogue that, oh, well, if too much Bitcoin mining comes to the U.S., like we're going to have the same issue that we had in China. I personally, I disagree. I think the decentralization of the governance here through the states is going to have a be a big firewall for any sort of attack from federal government. But, uh, you know, that being said, what are your you know, what's your response to people that say that there's going to be there could be too much mining coming to to the U.S. borders? I mean, two questions there. One, federalism, which you bring up, right? The states' rights versus the federal government. I think that is a firewall. It's definitely a firewall. You're you're seeing states like Texas. You're seeing states like Florida. You're seeing states, you know, to some degree, Georgia and North Carolina that have their own idea on what should be going on within their borders. And then you have states like California and New York that have their own idea. And so, if New York passes a moratorium on mining within its borders or whatever the moratorium technically said, it has no effect on other states that have their own ideas of what's going to go on there. So yeah. you're seeing kind of the decentralization play out in real time, right? You just saw something happen in New York and you're seeing the opposite happen in another number of other states. But what you're not 
seeing in the news every day is the sovereign wealth funds globally that recognize the value of this network and are spending billions, tens of billions or more uh, within their borders to build infrastructure uh, that will further decentralize this technology. And if the past is any indication of the future, you're going to continue to see the adoption rate grow globally mm -hmm. and the sophistication of the people that get involved in the network uh, continue to grow as well. Yeah. What about the public markets though, too? Staying on your centralization thing. Stay with it. Wayne, I'm curious to get more into that topic. We can leave that there if, if, if need be, but uh, the public market sector is definitely a centralization factor that I see has sprung up. It's 20% of Bitcoin's hash rates now uh, controlled by public miners. And to your point, there is like an argument that just having public miners just introduces like a different type of regulation as opposed to like a bad regulation, right? We have like a patchwork of different jurisdictions that have ownership over hash rate. And there's even argument that public miners are more secure because they operate under like guidance from the federal government, federal government's overseeing it. They're okay with it. Uh, but it's definitely like a different attack vector you could say than previously existed. 20 public, 20 companies went public last year, 20 uh, mining companies went public last year that didn't exist previously. Right. So it's, it's at least different than what has been, historically norm for, for Bitcoin mining. Different how? Different because everyone is private, right? And so you operate slightly differently. Like you're, are you're you, still under are they, So Go do ahead. you remember the hash rate in the percentages in China? Mm -hmm. Pre- yeah. Pre-centralized, yeah. Yeah. What what was it? Over 50% at one point. Over 50%. Yeah. So yeah. we're talking about, you just said 20% in the capital yeah. markets here. Uh, there used to be centralization to the tune of over 50% of the yeah. network in China. And what's the difference between China and the United States? Yes. They're an autocratic authoritarian regime, yeah. right? There are no individual freedoms in China. And so you had to look towards an attack vector. There was none greater than what existed before. Mm -hmm. And if China could have attacked the network, right? With over 50% of the network within its borders, it would have attacked the network because they didn't want it there. And guess what they did? They banned it multiple times. Yeah. All ineffective. They banned yeah. it in 13. Nothing happened. They banned it in 17. And they banned it again in 21 when they got rid of the miners. I think they just banned it again. I think yeah. they just banned it one more time <laughs> for good measure. Uh, if you if it worked, banning something, yeah. you know how many times you'd have to ban it? Once. Once. Yeah. You'd have to ban it one time and it would go away. So what they what they figured out and what these countries started to realize is if you ban it, the usage, it increases and increases. Right. So there is no effective way to, to somehow tack vector this network with 20% of the hash rate in America. Yeah. There was no way to do it with 50% of the mm -hmm. hash rate in China uh, with much more strict regime in charge of the infrastructure. And so I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a buildup in America yeah. because uh, capital markets pushed it here. And, and the reason they pushed it here, greater freedom. We mm -hmm. have greater freedom today than most other countries. Uh, and the goal is to continue yeah. to, to, to support greater freedoms within America. But we have property rights here that don't exist in most, most other countries. Yeah. And so, the, so you, you saw the technology come here. Uh, as other countries realize the benefits of this network, they're going to build it too. And guess what happens whether they have them there or not? You build a network. It, within your borders, whoever utilizes the network, yeah. they have property rights, yeah. right? That's why China didn't like this network because you can't seize the Bitcoin, right? You can't seize the Bitcoin because you can't hack the network, which means yeah. the hackers can't hack the network and the government can't hack the network. So if you have a digital wallet that you self-custody, nobody can take your Bitcoin from you, yeah. right? That's why China didn't like it. It's a centralized, centrally planned uh uh, form of government. If yeah. they can't centrally plan, then nothing works. And so you can't centrally plan when people, when you can't seize people's private property. Yeah. And so this network brings private property to, to, to the world yeah. as a result of that. So, you know, to your, to your second question about capital markets, yeah. I'm going to say that I'm not as concerned as I would have been with over 50% of the hash rate in China yeah. over the years. You also saw a, uh, a number of the early FUD questions, mm -hmm. which you you two gentlemen don't have to deal with, but the, the most common FUD question from 11 to 15 or 16 
was China controls the network yeah. and you're a Chinese stooge. Like, mm-hmm. do you really think this technology is not Chinese birth? And I can't believe you're building mm-hmm. for the Chinese government. And so you don't hear that anymore because China banned it. Yeah. But that was a that was a big point of contention for a long time that the Chinese. How did you respond to that in that time? Was there like a quick response that you had or I mean, you just how did you get people it off was, of you? It was a vi- it was just talking about the decentralized network yeah. that, you know, you cannot seize the means of production and it would move. But, you know, it, it I'll tell you when you have over 50 percent of the network within the Chinese borders to see how this played out is an amazing use case for the network. Yeah. I, I think even like Sailor, that was one of the reasons why he was, was the, during the block size wars. And then also seeing, um, the hash rate move here was like, it made him even more bullish on, on Bitcoin. What did it make you more bullish on Bitcoin to see the hash rate leave China? Yeah. It dropped. We were in the, you know, one teens, 120, 130 fell to 60 mm-hmm. Terra, you know, extra hashes. Uh, and, and then, you know, quickly we were back up, I think in the 240s, 250s recently, I think it only took six or nine months to recover fully. Yeah. And we're going to drop down as the price goes down, a lot of the old equipment gets turned off right now. So I'm, I don't even know what the hash rate is. I'm just assuming it's going to be under 200. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 185. Check this morning, actually. Mm. Uh, curious, we're one year anniversary of the China ban. So like looking back on it. Which one? The one year, (laughs) the infrastructure ban, the Chinese Bitcoin mining ban. So like they went, you know, province by province. It was May through June of last year. So we're basically a year out of it. What are some lessons for the Bitcoin mining industry? May and June, they they shut down different provinces and different time periods. Yeah. 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 I didn't realize. Yeah. They went jurisdiction by jurisdiction, which is interesting. I'd love Mm -hmm. to see some like investigative reporting about why they did it that way. That's where the Chinese generals were. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, you saw in China, you had the southern region, right? That mm-hmm. Sichuan region was yeah. was hydroelectric powered. Yeah. Um, so maybe the, the type of energy used yeah. caused the delay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I wasn't aware that they shut down different regions at different times. Yeah. Yeah. They went piecemeal, which was interesting. I think it tells you a little bit about how they do things over there. Uh, it's more like... United States, we have our states and different regulators as well. It seems to be so energy markets are pretty distributed here. Yeah, a little bit different. But to the, just the question, one year later, what have been some takeaways from watching Bitcoin mining decentralize? And then what is your expectation going this next year? You've sort of danced around the answer a little bit so far. Which part? About your expectations going forward. Well, I said, I, I, I said a couple of times, mm-hmm. I see it decentralizing further globally. Definitely, definitely. Like more so in the United States, you said that already, but like Texas, Georgia, New York, anywhere. So you particular. want a state by state answer? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So yeah. I think the states that are hospitable to the network are going to mm-hmm. see it grow. Mm-hmm. And the states that are not are going to see it not uh, grow within their borders. Yeah. The New York ban that took place that people seem surprised about shouldn't have yeah. been surprising at all. Mm. New York's been an adverse uh, party to Bitcoin mining and other related blockchain um, technologies within its borders from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. You know, if, if you're going to do any type of research before you build or capital allocate to a specific yeah. area, you want to make sure that they're hospitable to the technology yeah. within their borders. If they're not, you're going to have a problem. And so when we looked at New York, we didn't, we talked not only to the elected officials and the community um, development mm-hmm. people, but we talked to some of the citizens at, at certain events and unanimously, none of them wanted us there. Mm. So we didn't go there. We didn't go there. Wow. And even if you were like renewable and like very in favor of like, they don't green. They didn't understand the technology and they didn't have the, they didn't seem to be too interested in learning about it. Mm. And so we left and, and, uh, we passed on a number of different facilities upstate New York, near the Niagara Falls area, uh, and, you know, near Buffalo too. We're, we looked all over. Uh, but as a result of the community, uh, overall consensus from what we talked about, they, they just didn't want this technology. It was very similar to what happened in Washington State early on. Yeah, You saw a lot of miners move to Washington State because there's an abundance of hydroelectric power there. The, the communities originally were happy to yeah. have them the additional uh, capital going into their economies in some of these very rural areas. And, and it turned very quickly on them. Uh, we were hosting up there. 
yeah. in some facilities and we were looking at locations to to build but the 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 representatives and the people at the utilities and one of them testified in front of congress during the yeah. infrastructure hearing the the uh they, they just they made it very clear they didn't want you there mm -hmm. and so most people avoided washington state mm -hmm. only as a result of the sentiment of the people that were up there governing the different towns that, that's, that's really interesting that you say that because i when we were interviewing lee just a couple of days ago lee ratcher i'm sure you know yeah, texas blockchain he's council great. he's amazing um i asked him i said you know over this past year so much bitcoin mining has come to texas like yes you already had this like really like positive regulatory framework that didn't need to change it was just already in place it was beneficial to miners but has anything changed in the last year that really has started to attract the miners from a regulatory perspective? And he said, it wasn't so much that laws changed. It's just that we've been very open as a state that we want the Bitcoin miners here and that we're welcoming them to our state. And so it's ties just right into what you're saying. It's very little to do with the laws and more to do just like, are you guys wanting us to be here? Or yeah, It's a very capital intensive business. You have, it's a data center business at its root. You're building a, a box mm -hmm. that has electricity coming into it. And inside the box that has electricity coming into it, you're putting computer servers inside of it. And so it's a data centered business. It's very capital intensive. You need substations, you need switch gear, you need the uh, electrical wires to, to reach your building. You need to have, you know, uh, all of the, you know, there, there's, it's super complicated to dissipate the mm -hmm. air either you know, you can air cool it or you can, you know, the immersion cooling in certain other ways, they have some uh, interesting water cool. The infrastructure to build it properly and run it is massively capital intensive. And so the, if you're going to go to a region that outright tells you they don't want you there, uh, you're going to have a problem. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin mining or you're building a car manufacturing facility or a restaurant, you know, if they don't want you in the community, you're going to have a problem there. And so I don't think it's surprising when people go into a place that everybody knows is adverse. Yeah. Um, Texas happens to not be adverse. Uh, there's a number of hundreds of cities and towns in, uh, in America within certain states that, that are very uh, accepting and, and really looking to, to develop a footprint in this industry. Yeah. And you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere where there's uh, power. Right, you need you need to have power. You need uh, transmission lines from the energy generation source, and then you need to figure out uh, how you're going to manage it and run it. But yeah, I mean, this the Bitcoin mining allows you to go out of dense population areas to to remote areas that have those you know necessary power and and uh, the ability to build a data center location, you know, depending on scale. So we only have a few minutes left with you and the merge is coming up pretty soon. And so we should maybe finish there, change the conversation. Proof of bit. work versus proof of stake. Proof of work, proof of stake. This yeah. is like the time to find out about it, right? This is the time <laughs> for all the ETH people to actually like put up or shut up. So what's your take on it? And obviously pretty heavily proof of work of your history, but has anything going into proof of stake, going into the merge, changed your opinion at all or still? I mean, is it going to happen? It looks like it's happening in August. The last test time was successful, so it looks like they're they're moving forward with I, it. I've heard it's going to happen for a long time, yeah. so I don't. I'm not necessarily <laughs> certain. I will take the over if you want to bet a dollar. August is the, is yeah. the call. I'll take I'll take over August for a dollar. But anytime you have stakeholders running an entity, an organization, and development uh, development team and developers, you have a proof of stake network, right? Mm -hmm. Proof of stake networks have existed for the entirety of human history. Yeah. All of the governments, banks, corporations that exist today are proof of stake. The stakeholders control them. And so the proof of stake technology is interesting on a startup and interesting on a on sort of a uh, a business and economics front. But yeah. it, they're completely different than the proof of work. Yeah. Right. Uh, what it what proof of work offers, which is the first time ever you eliminate the uh, the people existing at the mercy of the stakeholders. It's, yeah. it's completely the opposite. So I think there's a lot of confusion on what proof of, proof of stake is and what proof of work offers. And there's a lot of people that think they're very similar mm -hmm. and they're completely different. Um, but, you know, in terms of the merger and what's going on with ETH developers and Vitalik, I have no clue. I don't, yeah. I don't study any of that stuff. Um, 
you know, there's, there's interesting proof of stake projects in every industry. So, yeah. you know, what's going to yeah. make it and what's not, I don't know. I think, you know, you just look at the, the rate of success for traditional startup companies, which I don't know, is 1% of mm-hmm. startup companies make it. And so I think, you know, if you go into these startup companies, knowing that very few of them are going to survive, yeah. then, then that, that's a good perspective to have on an investment side. But uh, yeah, no, uh, proof of work, proof of stake, very, very interesting and different technologies. Yeah. And then, you know, what's going on on the ETH network is, is yeah. not something that I have a <laughs> skill set in explaining. Yeah. But yeah. proof of work though, vital, I mean, for Bitcoin and now I've seen it's under well, attack. Well, that's all it is. I mean, yeah. proof, I mean, the innovation of Bitcoin is the proof of work, right? What, so what do you mean by that? The, the consensus mechanism for Bitcoin does not rely on stakeholders. All other systems that have been created globally forever, revol- they revolve around the stakeholders' approval. So the stakeholders vote and they approve something or deny it. That's proof of stake. Proof of stake or stakeholders control the coins in, in these digital asset projects. But look at companies, look at governments. The, ma- the majority decides. They decide. So the stakeholders get to decide what happens. The problem with that is when humans are deciding functionality, if it's ledger based, so if you have a, so, and what the Bitcoin network specifically was created to stop was if the stakeholders are deciding the truth of the ledger, right? So, and, and by the way, everything runs on a ledger. Yeah. Your entire life is on a ledger. You don't, the bank doesn't know how much money you have Mm -hmm. in the bank without a ledger. The automobile company doesn't know if you have a insurance or title or any, nothing exists. Yeah. You have nothing if the ledgers are corrupted. Yeah. They can, they can erase your whole life with a corruptible ledger. And so what you have is stakeholder run systems. They have two problems. You have ledgers that dictate everything and you have human error, which occurs all the time, innocent human error. Mm-hmm. And then you get human fraud, yeah. which also occurs all the time. And so on a stakeholder run system, it's really, really difficult to root out error and fraud on chain. And so how do you know what happened 500 years ago? Well, you read a history book. Yeah. That history book was run by stakeholders, right? Yeah. Stakeholders on the history book. So how do you know that it happened? Right. You don't because whoever won wrote down what happened. And so it's really hard to differentiate truth from fiction on a, on a human run stakeholder led ledger. And so what Bitcoin changed was this ledger, which was run by stakeholders, because there's no other way to do it. They changed it to be run by computer servers. And so this consensus mechanism that was created in the Bitcoin white paper allowed the ledger to be controlled digitally on a consensus mechanism that audited the transactions to their inception every 10 minutes. And so when you send somebody a Bitcoin, it's audited. And after it self-audits on this proof of work consensus mechanism, it's written to this third entry, which is the first accounting innovation. It's a much longer conversation. It's the first accounting innovation in 700 years. So the Bitcoin proof of work network innovated accounting at its root to make it immutable. And so now, as opposed to what happens on a stakeholder run ledger, which you don't know if it has human error or human fraud on it, you know as a certainty that this new ledger that's run by proof of work has no shareholder or stakeholder fraud or human error. So it's hundred percent true. So you can look at a ledger for the first time in human history and you know that it's the truth that on chain, that's the truth. We've never had that before. So that's going to grow for the rest of your life. That's the most important foundation for all technology truth. And so once you can discern truth, you can build layers on top of that. And that's what's Mm -hmm. going to happen to Bitcoin and, and we'll see that play out and you'll see the adoption grow and you'll see the price go up and down. It's all irrelevant. Yeah. It's all irrelevant. Yeah, man. I mean, that's absolutely a great way to end it. Just Bitcoin is the first time we've ever had truth that we can- On chain. On chain. Something that can be recorded and that 500 years from now, someone can look back and know exactly. that it wasn't altered. Right. And that's never happened before. Never had that. So that's an incredible innovation in itself. Yeah. 
It was two, three fire round questions to close out here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all mining <laughs> stuff. All mining stuff. All mining. We don't really. do price predictions on the Compass podcast, but we do hash rate predictions. Where do you see us ending this year in terms of hash rate for the network? It's a good question. Um, and it's very uh, correlated to price. So way to stick that in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say uh, hash rate prediction. We're in the 180s right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we get the price, if the price goes back up, which to me is irrelevant, and I know this is not mm-hmm. all that popular, but I believe they're dictated by the halvings, the, the price to me is irrelevant until 2025. Okay. We're going to trade sideways up and down a little bit. You know, people do bad things. Price will drop. If there's, you know, regulatory uncertainty in America, the price drops. All of that's short term irrelevant to me. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and, and likewise, the hash rate by the end of the year is, is it arbitrarily. Um, anyway, but so if I have to make a guess on this podcast to comply with your three question deal, uh, I'm going to say, We'll get back to the mid twos. Okay. If we're at 180 right now and we were in the mid twos, in the mid twos, if the hat, if some, something happens and the price increases above the, the, uh, 50,000 range, I think we see over okay. 300. Okay. Next question for you. Yeah. I'll try to answer them quick. <laughs> <laughs> Will the U S and Canada maintain over 50% of the next network's hash rate the next few years, or is it going to decrease? What's what's Canada's footprint? Canada's so around twenty percent, I believe. If you it's supporting a little high, but the U.S. is making up for it with like over thirty five percent. So between the two of them, it's over fifty percent, I believe. Yeah, I mean, you, I don't think Canada matters. I think that uh, the U.S. will be, you know, in the thirty five to fifty yeah. percent range uh, for the next couple of years, and then I see it dropping dramatically okay. as governments globally build infrastructure and decentralize the network on their own. So I think. The decentralization argument um, becomes moot as more and more countries start developing their own infrastructure, which is happening yeah. now yeah. at scale. Okay. Last question for you. What's going to be the second largest state for hash rate in the United States in two years? It's not the first. We all know Texas. Texas is number, number one. one. Yeah. That's a good question. What's, what's number two now? Number well, two technically it's Texas right now. No, I think Georgia's number one. Georgia's one. New York is two, I believe. Is it? Yeah, I mean, all these are just estimates on snapshots that are poorly constructed themselves. I guess where do you see the, a lot of the hash rate going? Of the, it's yeah. going to be dictated by this next election. Okay. So the election will dictate where this hash rate moves based off the regulatory yeah. environment within the borders of that state. So, you know, I, I can't predict what's yeah. going to happen in this next election, but uh, you know, we're, we're located in Kentucky, yeah. which is very friendly, uh, North Carolina, likewise, Georgia. Uh, North Dakota yeah. and Texas. So um, those are those are five good states. Yeah. We like those states. So I, I would look to see one of those okay. in, you know, or all of them in the top five to 10 for yeah. certain. Different answer than I've gotten from everyone else. That's good. That was a, that was a that better makes better. Answer. What, yeah. was the, what were the other answers? I've heard Kentucky a lot. People just give me states and they just based off of like taxation sometimes, sometimes just like gut feeling. Uh, but I haven't heard the elections cycle thought yet so that's good yeah we'll have to get a detailed explanation of that on the next episode yeah, how the elections I impact sitting back, so I don't know <laughs> how that's going all right awesome. good Darren. good to, good good to have to you be on. here yeah. thanks for having thanks me for your time of course right.